love coming uh, to, to just the educational events because I personally get so much out of it. Um, but uh, it's exciting to be here today. Uh, my name is Rizaldi. I'm with 210 Home Buyers Warranty, and uh, this is my sister. I'm Riz Nauman. I'm also with 210 Home Buyers Warranty, and together we make up Team Riz at 210, and we are um, siblings in service for your home warranty needs. Yes, and just want to take uh, just a few minutes to talk about more in 24 and what we're going to do. Actually, it's what we've already been doing over the course of the past year, really, as far as the company. Uh, we have some new brochures that we put out. Honestly, and, and I feel like it's, it's, you know, it's a waste of a lot of trees. Uh, there's only a few changes in there. Our pricing has not gone up for, for our Supreme package. Uh, there's a couple options that have improved. Um, so not a lot of bells and whistles, which other companies may be rolling out with. We did, you know, we printed anyway and put it out there. Um, what we've been, been pro uh, providing is very similar to, I think, what Keller Williams does, is lead the industry in technology. Uh, it's not anything sexy, right? But it's something near and dear to me as far as it touches the customer. So for me as a consumer, and I have a personal, because I'm going through it right now, um, the technology, we spent a couple million dollars to where when someone puts a claim in, it goes right away to a contractor. So for example, I'm going to give you a case study for myself this past week. Uh, my refrigerator, uh, refrigerator kind of went on the fritz. So, and it's the first time I can actually use the claim as a, cons uh, as a customer. So I put it in maybe a minute later, two minutes. And this is something that I've always talked about, right? But never personally experienced. A couple minutes later, I had a contractor. Now they have 24 hours to really get back to you, but now I have their name, the company name, and a telephone number. Because I'm in the business, I'm gonna go ahead and call him and schedule an appointment. But it was that quick. So when it's summertime <laughs> and we're in the same boat as every other company that needs an HVAC or, or a, you know, uh, or a, any contractor, we're going to be the first in line because we're going to get to them first um, with the technology that we have. The communication has improved and it's making it a lot easier, again, for your clients, our clients after close, right? Because we're gonna stay with them throughout the, the, really, while they have their home or as long as they have a home warranty. But that's what I wanted to really talk about as far as a big differentiator, as far as what we're bringing in 24 is that customer service. Again, not anything that you see up front or on the brochure, but the experience that they're going to have if something happens during their claim. So again, my name is Rizaldi. This is my sister Rizaline, Team Riz with 210. Thanks for your time. Looking forward to the next few hours with Jason. Love it, love it, love it. If you're a guest with us today, awesome. I am super thrilled you that you're here with us. I hope to get to meet you personally. Um, and if you're new to our company, welcome to Keller Williams Arizona Realty. What a great uh, first event for you to uh, come to. So, without further ado, Jason Abrams. Thanks, King. All right. Okay, so uh, it is that time of the year when the University of Michigan wins national championships. It's no big deal, it's just something we do. Okay, now that we've gotten that out of the way, let's talk annual goals. This is the time of year when everybody does their year-end planning. They do their annual goals and they set resolutions. If you did that, raise your hand. I think that's dumb. And I, I want to get into it a little bit. Um, I, said it the, I said it in December, and, and it was, I offended everybody. And I didn't mean it to be offensive, but I really do think it's, it's kind of misguided. And I want to remind everybody how we got here. So annual goals really revolve around calendars, hence the name. And the reason that we even have those is they had to collect taxes some way. That's the only reason. So if you go back far enough, they didn't call it taxes. They called it tribute. It's now taxes, and the United States government collects more taxes than any government in the history of the planet. Congratulations. Um, most people pay, not realtors, but everyone else pays them. And um, it's <laughs> quarterlies. And um, it's incredible, because in most parts of the world, they have a difficult time levying and collecting taxes. Not here, not in America. Americans, by and large, follow the rules when it comes to taxation. Again, not realtors. Um, 
And because of that, our government can borrow more money in wild amounts, meaning they have record revenues, but they also have a record deficit over $30 trillion. The only reason anyone lends them money is because they know we have this calendar. And on a specific day, what day is it? Okay, this is great. You all know it, even though you don't use it. And on this day, everyone shows up with it. And so everyone's like, yeah, we'll loan them money. That's why the calendar is there. And so those of you that have planned your life around it, I just want you to know you have fallen for the trap, the annual calendar trap. And I know that most people that set goals, and it's specific to Keller Williams. So if you're a guest here, you're not in this group. At Keller Williams, we don't accomplish them. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, I can tell you that factually. I'm a data guy. And I can tell you, and here's how I know, because in 2019, we had 40 some odd thousand people upload their financial goals into our database, CRM, command, um, and how they were going to make the money. And I know for a fact that 90 plus percent of those people didn't hit the goal. And I was blown away by this. And I looked up and I was like, okay, I wonder if that's just us or if that's everybody. Because if 90% of the people set a goal but didn't hit it, maybe there's a problem with the way we're setting goals. Or maybe we just have a problem with the people that we have. They were, I was open to both. So I started to research it. Here's what I found. CNBC reported that 67% of all people that set an annual goal abandoned that goal before the end of the month of January. More than half of that group abandoned the goal before the 15th of January. Don't raise your hand if you've already abandoned yours. <laughs> Anyone in this room ever joined a gym in January? Just kidding. So you can see the problem that we have, which is these things don't work, and yet we keep setting them, which is why you've been alive for as long as you've been alive, and you might not have all of the things that you wanted to have, although I'm willing to bet you set a goal to have them. It's dumb. It's as dumb as vision boards. Um, but we <laughs> I don't understand that at all. Like the arts and crew, everyone's glue sticking, pictures of yachts. Like, because I, I see them in everyone's office. And then I walk in and I'm like, oh my gosh, do you have a yacht? And they're like, no, not yet. And I'm like, well, then take the shit off the board. <laughs> like, you know, it's, it's been there for three years. <laughs> like, you, you don't have that watch. Um, I just think it's dumb. And so you're, you're left kind of wondering, like, well, well why? Why do we set these, these things and then not hit them? And there's just this myriad of reasons. But one of them is because we're not setting the right things. And the reason we're not setting the right things is because they're often bored in the wrong arenas. We set goals around things that we want. We set goals around an amount of money. We set goals around this stuff, and there's really very little link to those things and adjunct happiness. Happiness, everybody thinks, is a very simple thing. I'm either happy or I'm not. The truth is it's wildly complicated. We studied happiness deeply. We did it before Megacamp because we wanted to speak about happiness. We had Gary and Jay and I put aside two days to write about happiness. It was three weeks later. We had gotten in his boardroom every day during it. And here's what we discovered. We discovered that happiness is this multi-dimensional thing. And here are the dimensions. Dimension number one is conditional happiness. I'll be happy when. And it's, I'll be happy when I get this thing. I'll be happy when I find this relationship. I'll be happy when I get out of this relationship. I'll be happy when I have this amount of money. You all know conditional happiness. You're experts at that. And it's very real. Conditional happiness is easy to make happen because you're the one determining what that thing is going to be. It's also instant. The minute that you decide what the thing is, you can go get it and you can be happy. For some of you that are slightly more materialistic than somebody else, and we shouldn't judge, but you can say, I'm going to be happy when I get a new pair of red bottoms. You can leave here right today and go buy them and be happy. Here's the challenge with conditional happiness. It doesn't last very long. And the more things you acquire and the more moments of conditional happiness you have, the shorter a period of time that you report being happy. Anyone who's ever bought a new car knows exactly what I mean. So then you get into the second dimension of happiness. And this is disposition. I choose to have a happy disposition. I'm going to be a happy person. By the way, that's a choice. Happiness is a gift that you give yourself. No one else can give it to you, and no one else can take it away. That's the trick about happiness. And then number three, I'll be happy in the end. Meaning, when you look back on your life, 
you'll feel happy about the one that you lived. This last one is a really big idea, and it came from a book called The Five Regrets of the Dying, written by a hospice nurse who had helped 6,000 plus people walk through the final doorway. And the number one regret of the dying, they didn't live their life. They lived life for somebody else. They didn't do the career that they wanted, they didn't, they didn't fall in love or they fell in love but then didn't actually catch it. They failed to get out of relationships. They failed to get into relationships. They lived life on somebody else's terms, worried about disappointing and hurting others. And it's the biggest regret. The reason it's the biggest regret, by the way, is because in the end, it's one of the few things there is nothing you can do about. You cannot go back to those moments. So how does all this come back to annual goals? Well, if you're not careful, you will set goals like I'm going to double my business or I'm going to double the amount of money I make. And you're going to set all these things. And then it's going to get hard because life is, and let me just tell you, 24 is going to be hard. It just is going to be hard. We don't know what's going to happen with interest rates yet. I know they think it's coming down. I don't really see that. You're going to have a really shitty election regardless of your politics. Like it's just going to suck for a while, especially here. <laughs> Y'all are nuts. Uh, like it's going to be really hard. And if your goal isn't more to anything that matters, you're going to quit. So how do you do it? Here's how you do it. Gary Keller says that you set five or 10 year or 20 year goals. Make them big. What's your 20 year wealth plan? What's your five year relationship plan? You set big multi-year goals instead of annual goals. And then instead of doing a goal planning retreat, you simply sit with yourself for an hour and you ask a series of questions on an annual basis to make sure you are still in alignment with where it is you think that you want to go. But before you do the goal setting, you've got to ask some questions. I'm going to give you these questions and then I'm going to switch gears and I'm going to make everyone in the room richer. And the reason I'm going to do it in that order is because if I start with making you richer, I might leave you no better than I found you. You'll just have more money. I'm really good at that part. That's kind of hollow for me. If I can help connect you to why and what you actually want and then make you richer, I will have accomplished something. Is that fair? Cool. So here are the questions. Question number one, who are you? Now, some of you are tuning out early. I get it. That's really esoteric. Like I grew up in Detroit. No one ever asked me who I am. You just made money and went to work. And that was how we did it. So if, if this seems crazy, I'm going to give you his answer just to give you perspective of how he thinks about it. Who are you? He says, I'm a very small part of a very big universe. His other answer, I'm a spiritual being having a physical experience. Now, I wouldn't have come up with either of those. Here's what he means. The reason his answer is I'm a very small part of a very big universe is because as soon as you forget that, you end up feeling self-important. And the frame that you look at the world is what's best for you. The challenge with that is that self-love is not really tied to real love. And the pursuit of self-love leaves most people feeling hollow. I never would have thought of that either. This idea of a spiritual being, I asked him, well, why do you say that? He says, because I believe that my spiritual life is this big and the physical part of it is this big. And the minute that I forget that, I stop living the way that I need to to make this incredible and I just have a really great car during this. I never would have thought of that either. But who are you? If you don't know, you got to think about it. The next, what do you believe? What do you actually believe? And if you don't ever think about what you believe, someone who doesn't know what they stand for will fall for anything. Knowing what you believe is important. Here's what he believes. He believes that everything can be solved. And everything is possible. And for him, that's really important. Because if you believe that everything can be solved, it doesn't matter how bitter the solution is or how much fighting there takes to get there. Everything is working towards a solution. So for a man who wakes up every day with what others would define as constant conflict, that's how he wakes up with a really happy disposition. He believes anything can be solved and anything is possible. What do you believe? In a sentence, what do you believe? 
The next one, what motivates you? Here's the thing about that one. If you don't know what motivates you, then when it gets hard, you won't know what to think about in order to get through it. See, motivation is really important, but it isn't on tap. You have to know what motivates you. The next one, why do you work so hard? Now, those of you that aren't, you're absolved. But those of you that are, why are you working so hard? There's some really interesting studies on this from really successful people. And it's going to surprise you. It probably, it, probably not you folks, but these other folks that they studied, one of the reasons they were working so hard is because what they were running from, not what they were running towards. A bunch of them had grown up in adjunct poverty, and in order to escape it, they had to work really hard. And they looked up 40 years later and realized working really hard had become a habit, and they wondered where the time had went. So why are you working so hard? The next one. When is enough enough? And some of you are thinking, enough of what? You're the person I'm talking to. You know what? You, it, like, deep down inside at that place you don't talk about at parties, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You might not have gotten to the point yet, but when is it? Gary answers this one in a way that I never would have thought. Gary says, for some things, it'll never be enough. Time with his loved ones and helping people with his wealth and protecting real estate agents. He says it'll never be enough for that. And I said, well, why do you need to answer it that way? He said, because I can look at my calendar and know instantly if my life is in alignment. If there's not enough of those three things, I'm out of whack. So for you, when is enough enough? The next one, what do you want control over? This one's really important. I spend every day, all day interviewing real estate agents. That's all I do coaching and interviewing. And from what I can tell, not this room, but other rooms, a lot of people are spending a lot of time trying to control a lot of people. They're trying to control outcomes. They're trying to control humans. My mother is constantly trying to control the weather. That's the thing she's most involved in right now. I get three updates a day. Um, you're not actually practicing life well when you're trying to practice and insert control. Because the only way that you can control people is to either give love or withhold it. And so what ends up happening is you become this on-off switch for the thing that you want to have flowing through you at all times. And so are you really in control of much? Think of it like this. You're one little thing on this planet. And there's 8 billion other things just like you here. If that didn't make you feel out of control, you can go further with it and realize that like 73% of it is covered with water, which you cannot fly or walk on. So the super majority of the earth is undiscovered to your life forever. And if that didn't make you feel small enough, consider that you're just like spinning on this rock, hurling through space. And in this little planet of ours, there's enough galaxies that outnumber the grains of sand on the earth. That's how insignificant you are. Sorry, not you, but you. Um, you. Like, we just couldn't matter less. You're in control of nothing. Like, come on, knock it off already. You're just, it's just not, none of it's real. So in your zeal to control everything, and yes, you too, you're controlling very, very little. And here's the problem about control. Until you figure out the one or two things that you need to feel in control of in order to feel good about your life, it won't matter how many other things you control, you'll feel out of control. So what are the one or two things you need control of? You insist on it. Gary only has one. It's his time. Gary says, if I can control my time, that's the only thing I need. Which is crazy, because I'm a W-2 employee of his, so he's kind of like in charge of my time, too. Because <laughs> the first thing rich people buy is poor people's time. I know. Um, but so we call them employees. Um, and so time, for him, is the most important thing. What do you need to be in control of? Just write it down. And if you don't know, just write the question down. Next one, what do you fear? What are you afraid of? And here's the thing. Here's what we know about fear. We know that it's a more powerful motivator than anything else. That's how you're hardwired. That's, by the way, why our species has stayed alive so long. It's because fear is hardwired in. There's very few of us that run towards the danger. Steve, how are you, sir? Good. Good. Thanks for coming. There's very few of us that run towards the danger. So... Here's the thing about fear. Until you look it in the eye and name it, 
It controls you. But the minute that you name it, you're in control. That's an old psychotherapy idea, but it's still very palpable today. What are you afraid of? Give it a name, point directly at it, and stop pretending that you don't know what it is, because you do. Thoreau said, everything to its rightful name. What he means is, as soon as you name something, all of the power becomes yours. So what is it? The next one is the most important one on the list, I think. What regrets are you trying to avoid? This is the key. Because here's the thing about regret. When you regret something, it's because it had meaning for you in the moment. No one regrets, like, ordering the patty melt in 2021 in August 9th, as opposed to the cheeseburger. Like, no one regrets, because it was lunch, right? It wasn't your last meal, it was just your next one. Regrets, though, are these big things that you regret. But here's the problem. If you don't visit the regret, data shows you will repeat it time and time again. It's tragic. I had this happen to me, specifically. I was on the road, I was only home, I should say it that way, for about 50 days a year for the first four years of my kid's life. And uh, I was out, I was working. And in any event, he, he did this thing at school, he was like five, like preschool, where they bring in their parents and it's like show and tell. And he said like, this is my mom, she's the greatest mom in the world and she loves me more than anyone else and she's an architect and I love her. And everyone was like, hey. And then he goes, and this is my dad, he's awesome, he's an airline pilot. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> I just was traveling for work a lot. And, and, I was, and I had all these kids looking at me, and in this moment, I had this choice to make. And so I was thinking, like, what do I say? And I looked up, and I said, I'm not just any airline pilot. Call sign Maverick. And I gave the entire plot to the first Top Gun movie. And they literally thought I was the coolest guy in the world. It was awesome. They were cheering by the end. And I went home that night, and everyone, my, 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 Christina was so mad at me. And I laid in bed that night, and I had this terrible regret, not because Goose died, but um, because I had just lied to 27 five-year-olds and felt great about it, um, but because I realized I had been really absent. And I was like, I'm never going to let that happen again. I looked up in October of this year and realized I had been living in Austin for five years, and I had seen my parents three times. I was like, man, how, how could I let that happen? The same thing? It's because I didn't visit the regret. If you don't visit the regrets, you repeat them. The reason we ask this question annually is to visit it so it never happens to us again. The lessons in life are only teachers if you go back to school. Two more. What brings meaning for your life? And I know some of these are esoteric, but if you don't think about them, you're not going to have any. So what's the thing that brings your life meaning? Nick Shivers, by the way, number one agent in all of Oregon. The guy's a beast. Sells more home than you can even comprehend. And he thought that was great. Then he goes on vacation to South America with his church, and they take him to see the sites. And one of the sites was across the street from a garbage dump. And at the front of the dump, he sees these dump trucks coming in, and all these little girls, 8, 9, 10, 12, standing at the front of the dump. And he says to the tour guy, what's going on over there? And he says, this is a very sad thing. The families of all those little girls sell them to the drivers 30 minutes or an hour at the time for sex, and that's how they get first pick of the garbage that are in the trucks, and then that's how they find food. He said it like matter-of-factly like that. I didn't even know that was a thing, by the way, until Nick told me. And Nick says that can't be how it is. That must be really unique to this city. And he goes, no, 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 it's every dump site. So he spends a week visiting all these dumps. Can't believe what he's, every dump is the same story. So what does he do? In that moment, he found meaning for his life. He starts sell a home, save a child, and thanks to y'all, because Gary wrote a, a, seven, a gigantic check, um, you are literally helping these little girls because they're taking their families and they're building them houses and they're removing them from this. And he wakes up every day not asking how many houses he's gonna sell, but how much money he can raise for those kids. That's what brings meaning to his life. Now, some of you, by the way, I'm, I'm not that kind of guy. Like, I think that's great. That wouldn't be my thing. And so, there's someone in this room, and, and no one raised your hand. But you're thinking, look, I'm not in, I don't need any of that. I just want to drive a really fast car, live in an awesome house, and find romance at least three times a week. Awesome. <laughs> like, 
You do you, boo. I'm in for you. We, we shouldn't judge anybody. That's great. If that's what brings meaning to your life, awesome. Then you should go do that. Because if you want that and you're not willing to stand up and do it, then you're going to have the regret of the dying and you will have lived somebody else's life. This divine thing of ours is a gift. You get to choose. That's the idea. If life is all about choices, then the mission of life is to get better at choosing. And you only get better when you think about it. And the last one, who are you in the end? In the end, on the deathbed, who knows when it'll be, who are you? What do you want people to say about you? And here's the reason you have to ask that annually. Because who you are in the end is not who you wanted to be. It's who you were. Meaning the things you do today color how people will remember you in the end. No one's going to say on your deathbed, how do you want to be remembered? Everyone's just going to remember you just the way you showed up yesterday. And for some of you, you're like, oh, shit. <laughs> like yesterday wasn't my best. <laughs> and it's OK, because others of you are like, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I was really purposeful yesterday. Awesome. No wrong answers. So he sits for in December, every December, for an hour, and he, he asks himself these questions. I got these questions in the springtime, I believe, of 2020. It's now 2024. I, half of them are still unanswered for me. I just want to be transparent with y'all. I don't have all the answers to these. I've managed to answer half of these questions. And I don't even know that I'm thrilled with my answers. And I've been having the meeting now once a year with myself to do it. So I'm just telling you that because even if you were to answer two of them, you'd be light years ahead of where you are today. Just give it a shot. Is that fair? Cool. If you do this, here's what you're going to find. All of the answers are easier if you have more money. It is not the secret to happiness, and it certainly isn't the secret to life. But money gives you more options. That's what money does. Evidenced by the fact that how many people you know that have money that look stupid with it. They buy terrible clothes. They buy ugly cars. It just magnifies who they already were before they had it, by the way. But it gives you more options. And the reason it gives you more options is because in life, you get to number one, pick your problem, and then number two, pick how you pay to solve it. Of all the things I'll tell you today, that simple line for me is the most powerful. I never thought of it that way. I'll prove it to you. Raise your hand if you pay a maid, somebody to clean your house. Anybody? Raise them high. I think it's good for this. Great. About 80% of the room. You people that raised your hand, you have a problem. The problem that you were trying to solve is your own wretchedness. I understand it. I have the same issue. I don't know how it happens, but things get dusty. I don't even know what dust is. It's gross. Somehow, we needed someone to clean this place up. Just living in it makes a mess. And you decided, the problem is me. The solution, I'm going to use my cash to pay someone to clean it. Those of you who didn't raise your hand, you had the exact same problem. You've decided to use your own time and expertise to solve it. It's the only difference. One group is paying in cash. The other group is paying with their own time and expertise. And you will find that everything in life comes down to that exact same rubric. You have all decided to be in a database-driven business. Do you agree with that? The problem that you people have is staying in touch with the people in your database. True or false? Great. Raise your hand if you're not going to call your database like you know you should this year. <laughs> Raise them high just so I can see them because it's my good eye. Oh, the rest of you are. This is so convenient for you. There's no data that supports that. Zero. Maybe I wasn't specific enough. <laughs> How many of you are going to call everyone in your database once a month? Perfect. Once a quarter. At a minimum, by the way, the data shows you need to call every person in your database once a quarter if you hope to talk to them once a year. So those of you that didn't raise your hand, by the way, congratulations. You're just like me and every other top agent on the planet. We're not doing a good enough job of it. So does that just mean it doesn't get done? You know, for the longest time, that's what it's meant. I'm just not going to do it. <laughs> Fooled you. OK. But what if it had to get done? Because you did pick the problem. So either you're going to solve it with your own time or expertise, or you're going to use your money to solve it. That's it. 
You don't have to feel badly about it. You don't have to pretend it isn't a problem. You don't have to ignore it anymore. It's got to get solved. And I want to talk to you about how to solve it. Because here's what I know. I can't go into details, but I can tell you this. Your industry has never been under attack more from plaintiff's attorneys than it is right now. Whether it's the do not call list and the new rules that are coming down on it, which are wildly onerous for you, and there's a brand new set of rules coming your way, or whether it's lawsuits questioning your value. You've seen these, or questioning the industry in general. So I don't know all of the answers, but I can tell you this. The agents that have the strongest database-driven businesses are in the best position to weather every storm that's coming, period. So I wake up every day and I simply ask the question, how can I get you guys to buy into that idea? That's it. And so I'm going to go from being esoteric to being very, very specific. Everyone in this room has to make a choice. And here's why you have to choose. Because in the absence of a strategy, every tactic is the right one. Because no matter when I teach, people come up to me. At the, so at the end of this class, someone's going to come up to me and say, should I do more open houses? And I'd be like, yep. And then someone else is going to come up and say, should I focus on new construction? And be like, yep. Someone else is going to come up and be like, should I do client events? And be like, yeah. I'm going to say yes to every one of you. Because I have no idea what your strategy is. So everything sounds good to me. Love it. Do it. There's only two strategies in real estate. You've got to pick one. Strategy number one, you have enough people in your database to get the amount of repeat and referral business that you want to have. So your strategy, love on your database. Everyone get that? Strategy number two, you don't. <laughs> That's it. You don't. So you got to meet strangers. This is the only two. So if I, would, if I started this instead and I say, raise your hand if you love lead generating and cold calling, there's always two of you that are like, yeah, great. The rest of you wouldn't raise your hand. But it's possible that you never need to lead generate a single day in your life again. If you choose strategy one, you're good. So let me give you the math on this. The most, as a percentage, of referrals that you're going to get out of any database is about 6.4%. So if you have 100 people, about 6.4% of them are going to have a commission experience on any annual basis. And by, and by the way, I'm not a math guy, but here's how I got it. I simply took the 88 million households in the United States divisible by an average of 5 million sales and came up with a simple number of 6.4 between 6.7. I don't know how else anybody would think of it. Because everyone always says to me, like, what should my conversion rate be? I don't know. I just told you what the most is, and I gave you my math on how I got there. Does anyone want to dispute it? No, just round down. Call it six. Great. It's easy. Call it six. Call it five. That's my math. I'm not just guessing, though. I actually did the work to get there. It's, it's hard to poke holes in it. OK, great. So, so at six and a half, give or take, are you getting your share? Now, whenever I mention this, there's always a group of people in the room that say, well, not, not my database. I do much better than that. I, I think that that's great. There's going to be outliers in everything. I just gave you the math. So here's how you do it. Everybody, write down the total number of people in your database. By the way, if you're a top producer or you're running a team, this is going to get dark as a 1,000 midnights for you in a minute. <laughs> so just write down the total number of people in your database. Now, for those of you that are like, I don't, I don't know how many people are in my database, you've just identified the first problem. Like, because that's the only business asset any of you have. I, I mean, because what, what, what else do you have? You got like the signs and the lock boxes. Like, that's not worth anything. The only asset you have as a real estate agent is your database. So somebody shout out their number. What was your number? 1,100. What else? 600. Who else? Just yell them. 2,000. What do you got? 832. 832. Perfect. Who said 2,000? Just out of curiosity. Cool. How many deals did you do last year? Ballpark. Well, I don't want to embarrass you. Perfect. This is wildly instructive for everybody because everyone's math is going to be depressing. Can I use yours? Perfect. OK. So, so you got 2,000 people, OK? It doesn't matter how many you have. 
Write down whatever your number is. I promise you I'm not going to get math heavy, but we're going to do a little bit of math. Everybody's database, everyone in the room, they all break down the exact same way. They break down into segments. And so if you're a top agent or any agent in the room, here's what you need to understand. What's my total number and then how does it segment? So here are the segments. Once you do this work, by the way, you're good to go. The first group is past clients. Take a guess how many past clients do you have total? Perfect. I got 300 past clients. Past clients. The next group is going to be your SOI, sphere of influence. Everyone seems to have a different definition for that these days. I'll tell you the right one. Um, these are people that know you, like you, and want you to succeed. So it's much less than you think you have. <laughs> Take a guess, sir. How many people you got in your SOI? OK, you're more likable than I am. That's awesome. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. OK. OK, he's got 500 in his SOI. That is awesome, by the way. You, popular guy. OK, that's, uh, that's 800. So we did pass clients. We did SOI. Have you ever bought leads? You ever spend money on leads? You have. OK, perfect. How many of those do you think you have? Take a guess. Cool. That's the next one. I'm going to put a dollar sign. That's for paid. 150. I can tell you why this is the order in a moment, but just be open-minded enough to imagine that I'm right for a second. Cool. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, fifty. What's the other 1,050 comprised of? Perfect. Great, I'll just round up. Now, <laughs> here, it's okay. Everyone's going to tell me, they're going to be like, um, I got this, I got that. Everyone's going to do what you just did. It's what, it, we all do that. Um, some of you are going to have your entire farm areas in there. Some of you are going to have the old wedding list in there. Some of you are going to, high school reunion group, Mark King is working on that group. Um, you're, everyone's going to have everything. Some people take their entire country club database and load it in there, by the way. It's all good. I, I, I use that word only to be pithy, just to demonstrate that we all have a bunch of people in our databases that we just don't know. It usually accounts for about half, if not more. It just is what it is. The reason they're in this order is because this is your pyramid of priorities. When you study real estate referrals, this is the order that they come in from. Past clients send the most referrals. People that know you, like you, and care about you are in pole position for number two. Doing business with leads you bought if you follow up over time is number three, and then it's everybody else. That's how it always breaks down. Does that sound directionally right to all you top producers? OK, great. Then we're not breaking new ground. All we're doing is revisiting, and we know this is right. So last year, what did you say, 30? Doesn't matter what the numbers. Great. And by the way, there could be a litany of reasons for that. You could have been on your yacht for half of the year. No one knows. So all good. You now have to do some math. You've got to figure out, you, you, you got to figure out in your current database right now what your conversion rate is. So everyone can do that really simple math. All we're doing is division, and we're coming up with a percentage. So do the math, and what's your percentage? What's, what is 20 people of 2,000? Do you have a calculator? What is it? We're doing that realtor thing where everyone's yelling a different number. 3%. Does that work? Is that the standard? What? 1%. OK. What's your average sales price? Perfect. Then because we never talk about commission rates, because there is no standard commission rate, on average, when you sell a house, how much cash do you make? Perfect. So $7,500 per deal. What's a 6% conversion rate of 2,000 homes? Take 2,000 and multiply it by 6%. What do you get? 
120. Perfect. What is 120 times 7,500? How much? 900 thousand dollars. What is 20 times 7,500? 150. What is 900,000 minus 150? 750 thousand dollars. I told you this shit was going to be depressing. Stay with me. So I want you to be honest with us because no one knows your situation. Do you have any other opportunities over the next 12 months to make $900,000 currently today, other than the modeling thing? <laughs> oh, right. Some of you are going to be like, yeah, I got, look, I got other stuff going on. I got these other investments. I got these other. Personally, I, I, it's hard to. It's a lot of money. And so here's the question. This 750 is all of the missing money in your life. Everyone did their own math, I'm hoping. The number you came up with is all the missing money in your life. That's the vacations and the college funds and the Range Rovers and the Red Bottoms and the Coachella suite. I mean, that's all the stuff. Kids' college accounts, although it's overrated. Um, that, that's all the stuff. And it didn't take into account any sort of lead generation. That's why when I tell you the most pressing asset you have is your database, I'm trying to prove it. Because think of this. If you were actually making the 900000 from this business, sir, and you decided to sell this business, what could you get for it? Well, let's just say for argument's sake, someone was only going to give you the nine hundred grand with no multiple. That'd be good. But most businesses sell at a 3 or 4x. I mean, I, so you tell me. I mean... If you had a business that pumped out 900 grand a year, would that cash flow be worth two and a half million bucks to somebody else if they could keep it going? Great. What other business asset do you have as a real estate agent that's worth anything? Cool. Then we agree that this is the thing. Now, how many, are you treating this like a $900,000? Don't answer that. Are you treating this database that way? Are you treating your databases that way? Because if you said, I choose strategy number one and your math, is anything close to this, we got a problem because you're lying. You didn't actually choose strategy number one. You just chose to not have a strategy. So now knowing the math, anyone who wants to pick strategy number one and get their unfair share out of their database, raise their hand. Great. Anyone who's choosing two and doesn't have enough people, raise your hand. Great. Do you realize what you've done? Everyone in the room has made a choice, and everyone in the room eliminated lead generation cold. Meaning you've all said, I'm not interested in meeting strangers this year. I'm going to get my unfair share out of my database, or in this case, the fair share. That is a wild thing to be able to say. So all of you that think the real estate business is about lead gen, you're now officially out of the lead gen business. Yeah, it's it, it, only because of how the math got there. 88 million households and 5 million sales a year. That's what you're going to get to. So you're now all out of the lead gen business. Congratulations, because you didn't like it anyway. You are now in the database business, which means that any tactic that you choose to spend your time on that doesn't roll up to your database liking you more is the wrong one. So for you people... If you're like, I'm going to do expires, nope, wouldn't roll up. Your, would your database care if you did? Okay, good. So you don't have to worry about that anymore. I'm going to do for sale, but would your database care if you did that? More open houses, nope. Internet lead gen, nope. You don't have to worry about any of that anymore. Here's the only thing you people have to worry about. It's the simplest drawing ever. It's the same drawing that's always been. And for your database, we have to figure out what the heck you're going to do with it to make you more likable. Here's the mission for your database. More likable to more people more often. And the reason for that is because people do business with people they like. That's it. It's no more complicated than that if you're going to run a database-driven business.
So how do you become more likable to your database? Here's how you do it. You offer them more value. There's a law called value squared. And without getting boring, what it says is the value that you give determines the value that you get. You people want to get value in the form of GCI, commission dollars, which means you have to give value in some sort of meaningful way for the people in your database. Value breaks into two things. Number one, needed, and number two, useful. What are you going to give them that's needed and useful? So let's figure it out. Step one, you got to make a list of everything you're currently giving them. We call it a 36 touch plan, although it never has 36 touches. Don't ask. Make a list, make a list of all the things you're doing now. Just start brain dumping. What are you sending? Are you sending a Happy New Year card? Are you sending a holiday card? Are you sending, I mean, Valentine's Day is coming up. Are you going to send a postcard that like tells the story of it? What are you sending? Just make a list of your touch program. That's step one. Step two is to circle every touch you're making that is needed and useful to the consumer. And it, what you're going to realize is there's very few. Like a picture of you and a lap dog is not needed or useful. It's adorable. <coughs> People love it, but it's not needed or useful. <laughs> it does, right? They don't need it. So here's the third step. Once per quarter, you got to pull out one or two of your not needed and useful touches and change it to a needed and useful touch. And over the course of three years, you're going to have the greatest touch program in the industry. And I'm going to walk you through the touches that I see right now that people love. Does everyone understand my logic? Yep. Great. Database conversion comes down to the power of your touch program. So how do you do it? It's really simple. You're going to hate it. Number one, everybody has to call all the people in their database once a quarter. Now, most of you are like, I'm out. I'm not going to do that. That's just a choice. You're just choosing to make less money. It's OK. You don't have to feel badly about it. I'm just telling you best practice, because you only have to do three things. Number one, I'm going to call all the people in my database once per quarter. If you're not going to call all of them, then just commit to calling your past clients. I will settle for mediocrity. If you can commit to calling your past clients, then I will not make you call your entire SOI. If you've chosen you don't want to be that wealthy, I'm good with it. Instead, make a new category, 25 people, VIP SOI. Very important person SOI. Here's the definition. They'll send you at least two deals a year. That would be 50 transactions from those 25 people. By the way, the people that will send you two deals a year, you might not have 25 of them. So maybe you'll have 10. That'll be 20 deals. Who are the people that are most hardwired to send you business? These are the people that are the most connected. These are the people that are the most friendly. You know who the people in your database are. Make them your VIP SOI and just commit to calling them and your past clients. And I'm, we'll settle. Number two, client events. And I'm going to walk you through specific ideas on all these in a second. You got to do them. If people do business with people they like, you got to spend some time being likable. There's two types of client events you can do. Number one, large events. This is when you get like 300 people together, give them bad chicken. Like whatever shitty food you can afford. Because there's 300 of them. So it's like, hey, I'm going to throw a really mediocre party and then call you 11 times to ask you to come to it. It's great. The second one is micro events. Micro events are when you go with one or two people or couples from your database and actually have human conversations with them. This is the trend right now. So this is great. We had the quarterly phone call. We had the events. The third one is powerful touch campaign. Got to send them some stuff.
And then number four, the last one, is your heart. You got to show them your heart. It's usually through charity. I'm going to walk you through how to do it. Those are the only things you have to do. You can do a million other things. If you do these things, you will win. You will get more referrals. So let's start with number one. Got to make contact on a quarterly basis. Here are the coolest touches that I'm seeing right now that are getting the most interaction. The first one is the Zillow touch. Here's all you do. You type in their address into Zillow. Zillow is then going to show you the Zestimate. You then take your smartphone and take a photo of the screen. Then you text it to the human and say, this is what Zillow thinks your home is worth. I have thoughts. What do you think? That's getting a 70 plus percent response rate from people that are doing that to their database because everybody has thoughts on what Zillow thinks their home is worth. It blow, whether they're wrong or they're right, everybody has thoughts. Here's the good news. If it's right, they write back, I think this is spot on. And you're like, isn't that amazing? And if they're wrong, you're like, this really burns my ass. Let's get on the phone and talk about it. It's great. 70 plus percent response rate. Genius. The number two most powerful call. And this one came out of Amber Hart, by the way, who is absolutely murdering her marketplace. And what she does is she picks a local charity. In her case, she just started one. But she picks a local charity. And she calls and says, hey, it's Amber. I'm your real estate agent. I'm working with such and such. Um, and here's my question for you. We're trying to help as many people in the community as we can. But it's hard to know who needs help. Do you know of anybody that is in need of some sort of financial help, but they might not know who to ask? I think that's one of the greatest conversations you can have. Because you're not calling and asking for money. You're calling and asking who you can try to help. Absolutely genius. She says the majority of the people have no answer to that other than what an amazing phone call to get. Thanks for calling. So she's under no confines to do anything, but she gets to make that touch. I think that's genius. She took it to the next level and started her own charity called The Heart of Lakeway. Because she's Amber Hart and she does business in Lakeway. I think she's a genius. The next one on the phone call, and this is the time of year to use it. It's the most powerful call you can make this time of year. You are simply calling to ask them, what's your real estate plan for 2024? Hey, what's your strategy for real estate in 2024? Most people will say, what do you mean? And you'll say, well, are you planning on doing anything? All you're trying to do is identify the people in your database that have something happening this year. Everyone will answer it in one of three ways. They have no plan for 24. Or they'll tell you what's happening in 24 that will help them with housing. Their kid's graduating, they're buying a beach house, whatever it is, that's when you know you're good. And then the third one, I actually just bought a house. Funny you should ask. And you want to hear those. All that is is a reminder that if you would have started this last year, you'd be richer this year. It's a positive thing. Those are the contact levers. Now, here's the math. If you call everyone in your database four times, you'll talk to them once a year. Remember, just because you don't hear them doesn't mean they don't hear you. Just seeing a missed call from you in a lot of cases is perfect. So don't be overwhelmed by, oh, I'm going to have to talk to so many people today. No, you're not. You're actually not going to talk to that many because they're going to see your name and want to do anything other than talk to you. <laughs> and it's OK. You don't act like you don't have people like that when they call you. You're like, shit, unbelievable. <laughs> Unbelievable. Right. OK, same. <laughs> That's the greatest thing that could happen for you. You're going to spend more time dialing than talking. Any questions on any of those? Sir? I've been in the business 45 years, and that's the most amazing thing ever. Yeah. Just all. They'll never answer. They, they just but don't pick you, up. The crazy thing is they pick up when they actually need you. And they're like, oh my gosh, it's so great you're calling. Yeah, right, OK. So yeah, you, you, you're going to only talk to them once a year. It's perfect. It's perfect. Any questions on that? Perfect. Now let's talk events. Is that the next one? Cool. We've got to do events. Now I told you that there were two kinds. There's the big events, and then there's the micro events. 
You could break those into in-person and digital if you wanted to break them into categories. COVID, the bonus of COVID is that now people understand digital events. And I think digital events are where it's at. I like to have a mix of both. So I'll give you the in-person ones first. Number one, I think that the large events, I'm seeing them go in reverse and I'm seeing more people do micro events. But here are the tricks to the largest events. There is a Keller Williams agent in Dayton, Ohio, who gets 2,500 people to his events every time he throws it. I, that challenged the entire way that I was thinking about events, by the way. Here's what he does. He hires a comedian, nationally recognized. And, and, and that sounds incredible to me, but I said to him, I'm like, dude, no one has the money to do that. You know what he said? You'd be shocked at how cheap it is. And I, I couldn't believe it when he said that. And I said, well, how, how do you do it? He says, I look up all the comedians that are coming to Ohio anyway. Then I reach out, and I, you can always find them online and their agents, and I just ask, well, how much would it cost for you to add one more night since you're already going to be here? I think that's genius. I never would have thought of it. And that's what he does. And all he does is he does it at this mega church, and everyone shows up, and he introduces the people and says, we're only here tonight to laugh because everything is so difficult, and this is my way of saying thanks. And that's the whole deal. He invites people to come watch this, and it's free to get in. And he adds people to his database, and the entire first section are all the people actually in his past clients in SOI. That's, he does that twice a year, and that's his entire events thing. I think that is absolutely genius. Number two, you have the Coalition Property Group out of DC. These guys are incredible. They get 350 people to show up to their events, and everyone that shows up buys a ticket at the door for up to 100 bucks, which challenged the way I ever thought about events, because my biggest problem is getting people to come. These guys throw parties that are good enough to get people to spend. And I said, well, what's the model for that? And he said, here it is. You literally have to think of it like you thought about your first weddings. Do you remember your first wedding that you planned? When you agonized about every detail? The second one, you just showed up and ate. But the first one, like you thought about everything. That's how they do every event. They find the coolest venues. They find the best food. They sample 50 different whiskeys to figure out which three they're going to serve. I would never do any of that. That sounds awful to me. These guys love throwing events. Raise your hand if you love throwing a party. Anyone in here? This is what you should be doing there. That's the thing about our industry. You get to pick anything you love and do it big. So the question becomes, do you want to go be a party planner and throw the best events? Because it's easy to know where the hottest event would be and then make it awesome. That's what they do. There's another dude who lives in a master band uh, community, not dislike DC Ranch, if you will, and his thing, once a quarter, he throws a giant event in his front yard. And the reason he does it in the front yard is so that everyone that drives through the neighborhood sees his event. And here's how he does it. Half the front yard is white, round, linen tablecloths, and they have it catered with beautiful food, and there's, it's all adults. There's mimosas, and it's incredible. It's on a weekend during the day. The other half of the yard is bounce houses and cotton candy and a scary clowns, and he hires professional babysitters. And here's the deal. Bring your kid for two hours. You sit and have an amazing lunch and watch them lose their minds. It is incredible. He's past 70% of all the listings in his neighborhood because of those parties. And what's funny is if you know this dude, all this guy wants to do is be at a house party. That's his whole life. I would hate that, personally. I don't like anyone in my house. I don't even like my neighbors. I use up all my words at work and don't want to meet anybody. He loves having house parties. Raise your hand if you like having house parties. Anyone here? Great. You're crazy not to be doing this then. It's about doing what you love and then inviting the world to watch. That's what this guy does. It's so effective that his HOA has asked him to stop doing it because no one's coming to the HOA events anymore. I swear to God. So what did he do? He now has them twice a quarter just to irritate them because every realtor hates their HOA. It's unbelievable. I think that's absolutely genius. The next one on events, once you get past with the micro, are the online events. And online events are really easy to throw. And the model, by the way, we documented it during COVID and it's still working today. All you have to do is this. 
prior to COVID, no personalities, no influencers, if you were, were willing to do private events other than for huge money. Like Lionel Richie was billing out at one million a night if you wanted to come to your party. Would you, anyone ever pay a million for Lionel? Perfect. Um, it's incredible because he does between 70 and 100 weddings a year for the ultra rich. I never would have thought of that. Isn't that crazy? Dancing on the ceiling, right. Um, it's a whole thing. They never, it was out of reach for all of us. Then COVID happens. Then none of these people can go on the road and perform. So they all start doing online events. And now you can pick them up really, really cheap. So here's how you do it. Every one of these people is a member of a speaker's bureau. You all familiar with that term? These are companies that literally, they sign contracts with all these celebrities and then that's who books them. So you just go to Google and type in speakers bureau online and they're all gonna come up. And they have a new, on all their pages, they have online events. And all you do is click it and for a couple grand, less than five grand, you're gonna be amazed at the people that you can hire to do a Zoom call for your database. You will be amazed. I, I was invited to two of these. I went to one um, with Sir Mix-a-Lot. Um, anyone know who that is? You guys, okay. So for, if you're in my age group, that's like pretty much the coolest day of your life. So I went, I'm online, it's 15 minutes. He did Baby Got Back, Lockjaw, and Swap Meet Louie. And I just sat there like in complete disbelief because I thought he was dead. He's fine though. <laughs> he's, and he's cranking him out. That was $3,500 to get him from what this person told me. It was like the greatest 15 minutes of my, I was taking pictures in front of my computer, like selfies. It's unbelievable. I went to another one. These people, they, they hired, um, there was a show on Bravo about fashion where everyone tried to design clothing. You know what I'm talking about? What, yeah, I mean, what was it, what's it called? Project Runway. They got the host of Project Runway to do a half hour Q and A. Now, I, didn't, I had never seen the show, but I still went just cause. And it was awesome. Like hearing their, th this guy's story, it was great. I think that's less than five grand to get someone to do a half hour Zoom call for your people. And so here's the question. In your age groups, with your database, who are the people that your folks would show up for 15 minutes or a half hour or 20 minutes if it was just as easy as clicking on a Zoom link? And you all, you're all kind of smiling because you're all like, oh my gosh, I would show up for so-and-so 100%. So would they. So here's the key to this. You hire the person. Then you simply send out the invitations and you do whatever kind of touch program you're gonna do. Then you get on the Zoom call and you introduce the person and then let them do their thing. Friends, it is the greatest touch and they don't have to go anywhere to get it. My advice to you, you do this at like three or four o'clock on a weekday. That way they watch it from their offices if they work and all of the other people in the office come and watch it. That's how they got me with Sir Mix. I had in, the entire KWRI watching my Sir Mix a lot thing. It's awesome. Any questions about that? You're gonna hear that person at Family Reunion, by the way, who came up with that whole model, tell the whole story. Unbelievable. Cool. You guys doing good? Are you getting this? Great. Okay, so now we've done events. You've nailed them. You gotta send something. And by the way, I wanna go back to the micro events for a second. All I'm saying is once a week, twice a week, you go out for dinner with one or two people in your database. I know some of you are like, well, that's not a system. It might be the most powerful system of all. Connecting with humans one-on-one, -on -one, that is a model. The key is to do it consistently though. Remember, everybody does everything consistently but you either do the right thing or the wrong thing. Every human's consistent though. This, so this idea that I'm not very consistent, you are, you're just consistently <laughs> doing the wrong stuff. And all I'm saying is if you consistently do the right stuff, you make a lot of money. That's the only difference. And so going out to dinner consistently is a great data place, uh, plan. Going out to lunch, great plan. Not doing it though and consistently not that's the wrong thing. That's why micro events are so powerful. Cool. I gave some of you an out by only making you call your VIP SOI. And so for that group, we have to add one more thing if you're gonna do it. You gotta add a gift. If you're gonna only call these 20 or 25 people, 
there's got to be some gift giving that goes on with that group. And Caroline uh, Hyo out of Northern California is the best gift giver in the company, from what I can tell. Now, a lot of you give gifts, um, and they're all great. I mean, there's no wrong gifts. So instead of, of telling you they're dumb, um, I'll just go a different way and tell you her rules for giving gifts because I think they're brilliant. It's only one. You ready? If you know me, then show me. And I think that's the greatest rule for gift giving there is. You ever get a gift that is so not for you that you wonder, did you mean to give this shit to someone else? <laughs> if you have, then you know exactly what it's like to get your 900th real estate agent tumbler glass with their embroidered logo on it. I get maybe, and I, I'm grateful if, if any one of you sent, I get probably somewhere between four and seven Yeti mugs a week sent to KWRI. They have a mail room and that I have my own mail room. I mean, I'm great for it. Um, but I've never had the problem where I can't find a chalice to drink out of, ever in my life. And that was even before I got this gig. Somehow I managed to find a cup even when I was thirsty. Um, and so if your idea of gift giving is what's the thing you're going to put your logo on and send it out, I, I want to urge you not to do that if you're running a database business. It doesn't move anybody emotionally closer to you to have a hat with your logo, even if it's awesome, by the way. I'm not saying it isn't awesome. I'm just saying there's no one that's like, oh my gosh, now my head won't get sunburned. What a gift. There's no one saying that. There, and by the way, I think, I think Costco knives are awesome. I love them. I don't know that I... I don't know that I've ever needed another one. I, I love the fact that I have 11 now. Um, but I don't know that I need it. I and mean, I don't know that, seeing as I, I, I don't cook anything, I don't know that that person really cares much about me. So here's the question. What's the gift that you can give your people that would show that you know them? And the challenge is it's not going to be at scale. You're not going to find it at scale. you got to find it as a one-off, which is why you're only doing it for your VIP SOI. If you know me, then show me. Caroline says that she every time she talks to the people, she asks the question, what's the gift I can give to double down and show them I was listening? I'll give you some examples. She gives five gifts for every transaction that she does. Now, her average sales price is $2.5 million, so give her a break. It's all good. That math works for her. It wouldn't work for me. Um, but it works for her. One of the gifts that she gives is always the closing gift, and it's always unique. So I'll give you an example. She had a woman that was leaving behind this lemon tree that in her backyard. She bought her a lemon tree. I, I know you're like, okay, that makes that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. If you know me, then show me. That's the key. So when you're doing the walkthrough of these people's homes, you should start thinking about what am I going to give them as a gift that shows them that I actually understand them on a deeper level. That's how they know you connected. The next gift that she gives that I think everyone should give is genius. She has multiple offers usually on her listings. Anyone that writes an offer on her listing that doesn't get accepted gets a $10 gift card from Starbucks thanking them for submitting an offer and spending the time to draft it. I think that's genius. Um, she said that the reason she does it is because she honors their time. But number two, anytime she's a buyer's agent on a property, she, she says that the return on those gift cards is insane. Everybody loves her and everybody calls her back. I think it's really, really smart. Cool. So now you have to have a touch campaign. You got to send them some stuff. I said needed and useful. So now we got to get into what these are and what the examples are. Needed and useful, think of it like this. Who in here owns a house? Anybody? Great. Then you know all the problems associated with being a homeowner, right? Start solving them. Write that down. That's it. That's it. Think about this. If you went to a doctor's office and you walked in and they were like, well, what kind of car can we sell you? You'd be like, that's really weird. I came here to cure my ass. I don't understand. Why would you ask me about my cars? Like, I'm just suggesting to you that the idea that we're not solving the problems of home ownership is very confusing to people that we sell homes to. <laughs> they don't get it. And all of the tech companies that would ideally like to disintermediate you from your databases, they wake up every day trying to solve those problems. 
So I'll give you the greatest example of this. It happened to me. I, I own the market centers in Austin, Texas with a couple of partners. One of the agents in one of the market centers sent to my house a postcard that said it's time to clean your gutters. It's that time of year. I don't know if do you have gutters here. Probably not on houses. Does anyone know what they are? OK, perfect. So then you know how useless that touch is. And I know that the person sent it to me because my 10-year-old came to me with the postcard and said, Mom wants you to clean the gutters. And I took and I couldn't believe it. And so I called the agent. I said, hey, dude, it's Jason Abrams. And he said, who is it really? And I was like, that's awkward. It's really me. And he said, well, why are you calling? And I said, I'm just calling to tell you to take me off your mailing list. And he was like, this is really weird. You own my brokerage. Why would you want me to take you off the list? I said, dude, because you sent a to-do list to my house. <laughs> like, you're ruining my life. I don't understand. Like, what are you going to send next month? That I should paint the house? I mean, like, I don't. What, what happens in December? You said I should come to your house and clean your garage? Like, you're killing me. He's at Remax now. It's really sad. But the the point the 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 point is legitimate, which is like no one needs a useless touch, and no one wants a reminder that they're delinquent. Please don't think that people aren't changing the filter in their AC because they don't know it has a filter. When they get your thing, it's time to change your filters. That, 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 they don't like you more. So the question becomes, what of these pieces can you take off of them and start doing for them at scale? And I'm going to give you some examples. Um, you have Heather Upton, who is a genius, by the way. She's in a small market in Indiana. Um, and she cranks out. And she owns this little area. And it's awesome. And here's the thing she does. Handy person services. And here's it, it's the genius thing you've ever seen. She had a big database. She took the newspaper and called all the people that were offering handyman services. And she asked them, how much money do you make a year? And finally, a couple people started answering. And she said, great. I'd like to hire you full time for that amount of money. And I got to tell you, they all wanted the job. Because in that moment, they were absolved from having, having the lead generate again. And here's what she does. She now has two of them. It started with one. They drive around her town in a little van that says Heather Upton Real Estate Handy Person Services. And all day long, they just do handyman work for the people in her database. That's less than $50,000 is what she paid. I think that's absolutely genius. All of her customers in her database, they all get what she calls an app, which is, in her case, a Google form. It's a Google form that simply goes on their phone. And when they want something done, they click it. And then it just walks them through what they need to get done. And I got to tell you, she's got some people that are up there. And all they want is someone to come hang a picture or help them move something to the front or help them rearrange their furniture or their toilet is running. It's all these little. Does anyone else have any of the problems I just described in your life? Perfect. Because people and houses suck. It just does. No matter how much you spend, they're all just are what they are. They're made out of paper mache. It is what it is. And so all day long, they just go to people's houses and fix stuff. What do you think her database thinks of her? There's never a charge. And all day long, she solves their problems. She, she murders it with the best $50,000. And by the way, seven of you could team up and everyone throw in seven grand and go hire this person. And that would keep them busy full time. Is an absolute no-brainer. It's just an example. You got Mr. Whatever It Takes, this kid. He, by the way, he, he's still doing window cleaning. Like, all he's doing is sending someone over to wash their windows. I know, raise your hand if anyone's ever called you and said, hey, can I send someone over to wash your windows for free? Would that be okay? Anyone? Perfect. Raise your hand if you'd say yes. <laughs> okay. Why not do that then? It's like 50 bucks a house to clean somebody's windows. That's a, just a needed, and you, that's better than sending the knife or the cutting board. Man, it's a, that's such a no-brainer. And you're now watching real estate agents come up with stuff that I never even would have thought of. David Voorhees just wrote a one-pager for us. You know what he does? He makes reservations at the hottest restaurant. What's the hottest restaurant in town right now that you can't get a reservation at? Is there, are there any? What's it called? Laomi. Laomi. How long does it take to get a reservation? Are they three weeks out? Three weeks out. Three? Oh, great. In Austin, this place, Red Ash, 90 days out. In Vegas, Carbone, can't get a reservation. I can't get a reservation. Family, anyone that knows the guys that own that place can connect me. 
trying to get a reservation for Wednesday night event. In any event, um, you're three weeks out. What David does, David goes in and he makes reservations three weeks out, five weeks out, seven weeks out, 10 weeks out, and he makes them. And then the night before the reservation, he calls his VIP SOI and says, hey, we had a reservation for Lammy tonight. Is that how you say it? I think so. Close. We have a reservation for, for Lammy tonight, but we can't go. Would you like to have it? It's for tomorrow. I got to tell you, people in Austin lose their mind when he calls them about Red Ash. Because no matter how much money you have, you can't get a reservation tomorrow night at Red Ash. Just like you can't at Laramie. And it's free. It's the greatest free touch for any of your databases. You all should have reservations at the greatest restaurants in town, and you should just be calling and giving away the reservations. Won't cost you a dime. I never would have thought of that in a million years. That's needed and useful. What about property tax disputes? Do you guys do those here? Why do you not do them? That's a better question. Do you not do them because they're all right? Because here's the thing, when you look nationally, because values have been going up like crazy and they haven't come down at all, which they're now starting to do in a lot of marketplaces, most people don't even understand the value and tax dispute industry. Do you know how valuable it would be if you saved someone money on their property taxes? What do you think they would think about you if you did that proactively? My guess is they would like you because everyone wants to be richer. I think that's a needed and useful touch, and I'm starting to see that come back all over the country. <coughs> we could keep going on these all day if you guys want more of them. It's hard to explain it because it's different in every municipality. But from what I can tell, from all, I've interviewed agents all over the country. There is a way to dispute the value of your property in every municipality. But no homeowner knows how to do it. And no real estate agent spends the time teaching it. So you have two choices. Go ahead. It's great. Works different in different markets. My yeah, mine's forty grand. So yeah, I, I get it. Um, I don't even know what they do with the money. Yeah, anything smart. Yeah, it's incredible. All right, well, so we're we're just going down the road of needed and useful. So I mean, I you know I've been saying some of these for years, and everyone's like, I've heard that, and I'm always like, okay, well then you're not doing it though. So like you've heard it, but you're still not doing it. Like Dan Ahara. You've all heard the things he does. They're the most simple things, but I don't know why not everyone's doing it. He, he only does three things. Number one, he sends a junk company to remove any paint cans or toxic chemicals from your garage. He does it twice a year. He simply calls and says, hey, do you have any paint cans or toxic chemicals that you want removed from your garage and responsibly disposed of? And he sends a junk company to take them, and every county in the United States has to have a facility to dispose of that stuff. That's an EPA rule. Raise your hand if you have stuff in your garage you'd love to get rid of in the form of paint cans. Anybody? Okay, great. You all have the same problem, rich and poor. So the second thing he does, he calls and he hires another junk company to remove large items, mattresses, bookcases, boxes, anything that you have that you can't just put out at the street, he'll take away for free. He does it four times a year. And he simply calls and says, hey, do you mind if we send someone over to remove any large junk you have? There'll be three burly, huge humans, and they'll do all the carrying for you. Do you have anything you want us to take away? Raise your hand if you do, by the way, at your house, have something you'd like removed if someone else would do it for you. That's everybody. It's every, everybody. Raise your hand if you've ever gotten that call. Me neither. That's such a no-brainer. and that's It's just not expensive. That's it. It's a no he, and the third thing he does is the shredding trucks. Twice a year, he offers to come to your house with a truck that shreds paper and remove anything you want shredded. You know who he says does that? People that are moving. Because they've got to get rid of that stuff before they move. That's how he identifies it. So one of two things is happening. You're either sitting there and you're thinking, this will never work in my market. Or you're sitting there and you're saying, this makes a lot of sense. Why is no one doing it? Which is it? Is it the second one or the first? I, I'm a big boy. I can take it either way. 
Yeah, it's the second one, isn't it? Okay, so now, write down, here, this is the most important part of the day. Write down the reason you're not doing any of these things. Quick, don't think about it, just write down the reason. Why aren't you doing any of these things? Now, having had the benefit of teaching this once before, I can guess at the things you're writing. Some of you are writing, you don't have the money. Some of you are writing, you don't have the time. Here's the thing. If you don't start doing this, I can guarantee you'll never have the money or the time. You are going to be in the exact same place next year. Because in life, you get what you get. You got to change something with your databases. You have to. The math on it is just too good not to. We already proved it. This has to be, I don't care what other thing you were going to accomplish this year, throw it out and just do this instead. How many of you are doing a pie giveaway? Anyone here give away pies for the holiday season? Great. What's your number one problem with the pie giveaway? There's always a problem. Is it that they don't pick them up? That was my problem when I did the pie giveaway. I couldn't get anyone to come get them. And I was buying those $5 Costco pies, you know, the ones that last in your trunk for 90 days, the good ones. But no one was coming to the office to get them. You know why? Because it's not needed or useful. Because they were all going to Costco anyway. And they were like, great, I, if I wanted a pie, I would have put it in my giant cart. I didn't get that. I did it for years and years. So I want to give you a different take on the pie giveaway. <laughs> we, I, whether I had a return or not, it wasn't a good enough one. Here's, and, here's, and, and it was Haro Setnian that taught me the secret of the pie giveaway. Haro had the same problem, changed it completely. And the way he did it was he changed what he was giving away. You can't give away something that everybody can go get for 10 bucks. Here's the equation, ready? Scarcity plus exclusivity equals cool. This came up in almost every single database interview that we did with people that had unique touches. Scarcity plus exclusivity equals cool. They call it the nightclub model. And it was coined originally by the Studio 54 folks, which is you can't get in and there's no place like it. That made it cool. So if you give away a pie that everyone can go buy, there's nothing cool about it if you use that equation. It, you, you people might like it, wouldn't fit that equation. So what did he do? He found the greatest single Snickers cheesecake on the entire planet. It was unbelievable. It was made by a small baker in his town. And he said, how many of these do you sell a year? And she said, I don't know, a couple thousand. And he said, great, I'll take the full year's worth, one condition. You're not allowed to sell them to anybody else. She took him up on it. He now buys, well, he just went on a year-long sabbatical, so he's not going to do it this year. Um, but he was buying 4,000 pies a year at the end before he did it. It's so good. It's, does, anyone know, does anyone know of a dessert that's so good that you crave it all year round and it's become part of your traditions? That's what it is. It's that good. There, there's nobody in his little town, and he belongs to this town that has this mega church. Christmas isn't happening in these people's homes without this cheesecake. And he gets 4,000 people over a month period to come to his office to pick them up. He, has, he hired coffee vendors to service the line two years ago. Scarcity plus exclusivity. So I'm not suggesting you have to go get crazy like that, but that equation should guide what you're going to give away. Like, what is it going to be? That's how you make the move to needed and useful. Now, there's only one other thing you got to send people. Ready? You got to send them real estate information. You just have to. In a poll, and there's so many of them, but Zillow has proven it. You don't even need a poll. People want to understand the value of their real estate. They just do. So you have to be able to send it to them at scale. That's it. At least once a month. At least. You can do it twice a month. you got to send them something that shows them what their house is worth. 
what's going on in their neighborhood. If you're a KW, that's a monthly neighborhood nurture. Just set it and forget it and be done with it. If you're not a KW, you got to figure it out. But you have to send it. It's wildly important. And the only reason you're sending it is to track whether or not they're looking at it. That's it. And so the rules for data is I send stuff and then track who manipulates it. That's why command was built the way that it was, and you can see the last time that they clicked on anything that you sent. Any CRM you're using should be able to do that. If you're using one that isn't, you should, and your technology is failing you, and it's stupid. Why would you send something and not know if they're opening it? That would, that would anybody on that one? Okay, that would be a mistake. That's it. I, there's, I don't want to like, there's nothing more complicated to say. These are the things that are working best. You don't have to do all of them. You just have to do these few things with your database and you'll make as much money as you want to make. Any questions on any of that? If there's either no questions because I bombed or there is no questions because you're like, yeah, this makes a lot of sense. Does it make sense? You, 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 you got to do this, and I want to help you do it. And so to help you do it, I've written two playbooks that you, can, you all can get for free. This one came out yesterday, so none of you have seen it. It's in command now. It's called the Contacts Playbook. And what I did is I went step by step, in case you're moving a database over, here, you want to take a peek? In case you're moving a database over from another system, or if you're starting from scratch. It's so short and it's so easy and it tells you exactly how to do it. So start there. The next one that I did is the database playbook. You'll get, you get both of these through connect. You just go into connect and then type in playbook and they're all gonna come up. In the contacts playbook, I sourced 84 of the touches that were best in the country from Gary's mastermind group. And I gave you the touch and then two sentences on what exactly it is. They're all there for you. Please go take them. Any questions on that? By the way, this new context playbook, it, it's easy. It'll make your life easy, I promise. Is that, has anyone seen this thing? If you haven't, raise your hand if you haven't seen it. Let's do it that way. Great. If, if you have not seen this, what I did was I interviewed 500 people last year. And then this one's for you. Congratulations. I, then I took the coolest 100 one-pagers from the interviews and I documented their models and systems. And I'm gonna beg you to do this. Whether you buy it or you just all go borrow it from her, you should not think of anything new this year. Please fight creativity as hard as you can. It's a very dangerous thing. Instead, go grab one of those, because here's what the deal. I didn't do any pages on anybody who wasn't making at least a million bucks doing that thing. So if you're like, well, that's not enough money for me. Okay, different, meet in a different room. But if that's okay, go pick one of those pages and say, I'm gonna do this. And then maybe you just make it a little bit different. You improve on it a little bit instead of coming up with something new. Everything we talked about today is in that book on one of those pages. That book came out in August. So you have all of it right there. So what I would tell you to do is go pick the three models in that book that you want to run and just put those three on the wall and just do that for 2024 instead of trying to come up with something unique because that just takes so much time and then you got to figure it out on your own. You don't want to do that. I also put the name of each person so that you could reach out to them directly. And in some cases, I put the QR code so if you couldn't find their contact info, that's how you find it. Any, and by the way, it's still, it's, any, I, I'm willing to make it easier if you guys can come up with a way to make it easier. Any questions on that? Perfect. Awesome. So why did I draw this? Because here's all you got to do. You just got to decide what three things you're going to do in 2024. Consistently. I just told you the things that I would be doing. It never occurred to me that you're going to do all five. I'm a realist. What three will you do? 
We may, because maybe you're going to say, Jason, I don't care what you say. There's no way I'm calling these people once a quarter. Great. Will you do the events then? Then you got to do the needed and useful. Then you got to give some gifts. I could settle for that. What three are you going to do? Everyone draw your circle and write in the three. Remember your choices. It's call all your people once a quarter. It's have large events or micro events. It's have a powerful touch program based on needed and useful. It's send real estate information at least once a month. And then the last one was show them your heart. And the reason I don't wax poetically on that one is because the truth is there's no company and no if you're a guest here, don't get offended. It's just because math. There's no real estate company in the world that gives as much money to charity as we do. Just that's how the math works. I'm sorry. It's also probably because we're the biggest, but that's not important. Um, we give more money. The key to giving, though, is making sure, in this case, that someone sees you do it. Meaning, I give a lot of money anonymously. Whenever I'm asked to do it, it's always anonymous. But I'm also not trying to influence a database of people to get to know my heart. If I was, I wouldn't be the anonymous guy. you got to share your heart with other people. And I'm going to give you two examples on how to do it. The first one comes from Vegas. I've been talking about it for 15 years, and it's still, I think, the best touch ever. It's the Foster Friday. Foster Fridays is the smartest thing anyone on the planet has ever done. Anthony Knight. You can look him up. He's had a great indie there, Platinum. I love this dude. He loves pets and animals. That's like his thing. He had this little dog who passed away, Mr. Biggles. He had a sinus problem. Disgusting little animal. And um, <laughs> it used to just mucus. It was really awful. Um, but he loved this thing so much. And this, it, he used to bring him to the office every day. And Mr. Biggles ran out of the front door and got hit by a car in the parking lot. It was, and he used to travel with this little, with this, with this rodent. And I felt so sad about it. Um, and so he decided to start Foster Friday. So what he does is every member of his team goes out to all the no-kill pet shelters in Vegas every Friday. And they volunteer there all day long. And they go in and they take pictures of all the, the, the puppies and kitties and, and bunnies and ferrets and vermin that need to be adopted. And then they put that on Facebook. And then as people come in to adopt them, they take another photo where they're handing the animals over and they plaster Facebook. And people lose their mind for it. The tagline for his company, we don't just find homes for people. You see how manipulative that shit is? Like, you don't even know this dude. And everyone's like, oh my God. Oh my God, ferrets. Yeah. It's unbelievable. He, he's got like 30,000 plus followers. Like it's unbelievable. And his database is they're made up of people that love animals. And so literally when they see a picture of a dog that needs to be adopted, they send it to their database. And before you know it, everybody knows in town that dude helps pets. And he takes it a step further. He has photo albums for every member of his team when they go on listing appointments with pictures of all the animals, like old school photo albums. And that's how they make it real for people. And in Vegas, it's like, you know, not that there's a set for commission, but there's a lot of people that are willing to do it for less money there. And so he'll say, you know, we charge 8%. Someone will be like, well, I can hire, you know, Deadfin to do it for blank, you know, for 1%. And he's like, yeah, but if I did that, all these puppies would have been killed. <laughs> And people are like, no, 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 I'll pay. I'll pay. I, I, just, I think it's genius. So that's the first example I would give you. And here's how you get there. Write down right now, what group do you want to make an impact in? If you were going to only be able to impact one group, is it, is it pets? Is it kids? Is it you know, middle-aged, moderately successful white men? Because anyone can help me. Um, like, what, what is it? What's the group that you're passionate about? As soon as you identify it, you're like 95% of the way there. And then you have two paths you can go. Number one, find charities that are already impacting that group and become a fundraiser. It's great. Number two, start your own charity and direct your own money. And in this country, it only costs like 1,500 bucks to start your own charity. In the UK, I, I, I came out of retirement maybe five months ago and started doing a little one-on-one -on -one coaching with, with agents. Um, and I'm really enjoying it, by the way. I'm trying to get to three. I have two. Um, and the guy in the UK, I told him to do it. And he's like, well, it takes three years to get approved. 
which is unbelievable to me. And I was like, well, it's not going to work for you. <laughs> Can't help you, click. Um, <laughs> but, but I'll tell you, like, for 1500 bucks to have your own charity, here are the rules on charity. Number one, it should probably have your team name or your name somewhere in it. Number two, it should be very clear what group you're trying to help. I also think it's an amazing way to let a legacy live on if you're inheriting a business from somebody. Because, you know, real estate's a family business, and there's so many of us that bring in our kids or whatever. <clears throat> Putting a charity in your name such that they can carry that flag for the next 50 years makes all the sense in the world to me if I was trying to do that. That's how you keep your name alive while letting their name shine. I've watched that work for a lot of lineage businesses. Cool. So did you pick your three? Anybody? If you did, you're right there. So here's how this works. You wake up every day and do your three things. Whatever piece of technology you're using, I use one called command. I'm going to write it command. Or if you're with a different company, whatever CRM you use. This thing only needs to do a few things. Number one, quarterly phone call. Every CRM should have a setting for a quarterly phone call. It just reminds you to call quarterly. It, in command, it's a smart plan. All you do is turn it on, and it reminds you to call your person quarterly. Someone said to me the other day, um, it's missing, command's missing blank and blank. And I was like, I, th look, I don't even, I'm not even, okay. <laughs> There's no piece of technology on the planet that's going to do everything that you want. You know how I know? Because for a short period of time, I drove a Bentley. And you know what? The steering wheel did not vibrate, which I think should be standard in every car. And you're like, why? Because well, I like a little massage when I'm driving. That's what I like, just like my first Grand Am. It was great, but no car does it. And so I'm miserable no matter how much I spend on a vehicle. And you're like, well, I would never want that in a car. Boom. That's the problem with CRMs. Because what you want isn't what you want isn't what you want isn't what you want isn't what you want. You're never going to find one that has everything you want. So stop looking. Instead, ask the question. What does it have to do such that I get the return out of my database that I want? That's it. Any, asking any other question to me feels foolhardy. So for me, I need the quarterly phone call. Then I need to have the real estate information. I'm going to call it, a, I'm going to call it the monthly neighborhood nurture. If you're in a different CRM, it's a property alert. If you're using a different one, I don't know what, what it's called for you, but whatever it is, it's got to send the information about where they live. That's it. Number three, tasks. And all tasks are, tasks are just a thing that reminds you to do something. That's it. So anytime someone says they're going to do business, you have to set a task to remind you to call them, and you pick the rule. The rule that most megas go by, it's in half the time. So if they say they're going to do business in six months, you set a task to call them in three. Call it a day. If you don't, you have to remember that. That's it. That's the whole thing. So, sir, 2,000 people in the database, you know exactly how it breaks down. If you do these three things with this group of people, odds are this year you will not make 900 grand. But you might next year. And if you did it for two years, it's almost a mathematical certainty. You'd probably make it in year three and year four. And that's the same for every one of you that did math. So if life is all about choices, get better at choosing. You've got to make better use of your time. It does not mean working harder. It means doing less of the wrong things and more of the right things. And these are the right things. Fair? Cool. What do you all want to talk about? We've got a half hour left. I'm willing to talk about anything you want. That's what I wanted to talk about. Any question will be answered. Nothing is off limits. Oh, you, you want to Google um, speakers bureaus. And then when you start going to those websites, they all have tabs for what type of speakers. And one of them is going to be virtual. All right, yes, sir. Um, what can you speak on with developing this? 
Oh, wait, will you will you source Zoom for questions in the chat? Yeah. Cool. Okay, whatever. That's the mic. That's the microphone. Yeah. Cool. What can you speak on in building systems and routines in order to like cultivate a workflow weekly or weekly cycle? When you say workflow, what do you mean? Um, somebody that has no attention span needs systems to be like, this is my oh. uh, things. Yeah. yeah. You should, you should, is it, are you talking about yourself or asking for a friend? Absolutely. Okay. Um, you should, you should just, here's the trick for your life. You should do considerably less. And it's the hardest thing you're ever going to have to do. It, it isn't a question of the workflows that you're using. It's a question of how many workflows you're trying to institute. So if you naturally wake up with a terrible case of ADD, and that stands for a whole litany of things, depending on how you want to say it, here's the best thing I can tell you. Don't try to have a 135. Don't try to have any of that. Have a 111. You need to do less, but more of the right things. And anything that you're going to do should have less than four steps. I'm you, dude. I, I am you. Which is why, by the way, I only write one pagers. And because and everyone, everyone always says, well, what was the genesis of that? And here's what it was. I would go to family reunion for 20 years and mega camp, and I would sit in the audience and I would take notes, which for me are just like tons of writing that actually can't be read later that have no value in my life. They're probably different than yours. Um, and I wouldn't ever get any richer. And then I would call these agents, because I, I knew, and I'd be like, hey, can you send me over your stuff? And they'd send me like a spreadsheet with 800 things on it. And I can't institute any of it. And so here's what I discovered. If there's more than one page, we can't all be on the same one. And for people like you, I'm going to do three things. There's going to be less than five steps for each thing. And that's what I'm going to do every day. That's my answer. Thank you. I appreciate it. Do less. Gary literally walks around Keller Williams, and all he does is eliminate things from people's GPSs all year long. That's his entire gig there. He simply forces everyone to do less always. And, I, and it was really weird at first, because I, I turned in my first GPS, and it was like, you know, it was like yours. It was, it was a full 13531. It was this whole thing. And I got back like a 123. <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh, you're. you're you don't think I'm capable of doing all this other stuff? And he was like, I just don't know why you would. It isn't about how much you do. It's about how much of the right thing you do. And this is the right thing. And that's all he does all day long. What advice would you oh, give wait, we got to throw you the box. What advice Jason, would you give to teams or rainmakers who are looking to grow a team in the market where there may be fewer agents coming into the industry? I get really clear on whether I'm trying to grow a team or I'm trying to grow a transaction number. So there's two, and by the, who owns a team? Anyone in here? Okay, if you, if you don't own a team, don't take offense to anything I'm about to say. And if you do own a team, don't take offense to anything I'm about to say. There's two types of teams from what I can tell. There's headcount-based teams and talent-based teams. That's not to say that they don't have talent on both. It is to say that there's a distinction between the two and the way that they're built. Here's the difference. A headcount-based team is I'm going to have as many people as I can that are going to probably end up with an aggregate average result. And they ask questions like, my people are going to do an average of one to two deals a month. How many people do I need to sell 1,000 homes? There's nothing wrong with asking that question. I think it's a great question and a great model. Then there's this other group that says, I want to have as few agents as possible to sell 1,000 houses. What do those people have to look like? Very different questions. The reason it matters is because they're both really, really legitimate business models, but they are built completely different. And you are picking your problem, and there's problems with both. So if you've decided to pick a headcount-based team, your problem is going to be recruiting, onboarding, and churn. If you've decided to build a talent-based team, your problem is going to be recruiting and churn, but in a different way. Because you're constantly going to have to add enough value to keep these amazingly talented people in your world. They're very different problems, but they're both solvable. So which one are you asking about, if you had to think of it like that? The headcount or the other one? Probably headcount more so. Yeah, if I was building a headcount-based team, that, here's what I know for a fact. It's probably different in this office. But in other offices, about half of everyone that has a license won't sell a single home this year. 
That's just the math. Your office too. I'm just guessing. Um, but that's across every brand. As a matter of fact, um, when you really look up, the number of real estate agents that sold more than four homes this year, what percentage would you guess? 20%. Yeah, every, everyone's like, it's probably a really low number. Yeah, it's actually a really low number. It's less than 20% sold four homes. So here's what I'd be doing if I was trying to build a headcount-based team. I would pick a magical number that seems to have more power in our industry than any other number in any other industry. It's unbelievable, the power of that number. And I would work backwards from $100,000. And I would come up with one page that shows the three or four simple things they need to do to make $100,000. And then I would call every single person that made less than that and ask them why they would ever stay doing what they're doing. And I would call it recruiting. But that's what I would do. And I would specifically go after the ones that sold zero. Here's what we know. When polled, the number one thing that real estate agents that sold less than four homes said they needed, take a guess, go. Please. Done. So now everyone knows the magic number, and everybody now knows the magic need. So all day long, I would wake up and I'd ask the question, do I have enough leads to make sure they have 100 grand? And then what you would come to quickly is, I have enough leads, but they're not willing to do the follow-up, which now you've picked your next problem. And you can solve that. There's only three ways to solve that. You either outsource it, you force them to do it, or you double up on whatever the agent count you thought you needed was, and then limit the number of people they're allowed to have on their pipeline. If you're building a talent-based team, it's a little different. The rest of it's the same. I know some of you are like, you know, it can't be that simple. Remember, the best things in life are the simplest, yet everything naturally wants to become more complicated. The answer, you know the answers. They're, they're staring you right in the face. A talent-based team is show me the person that can make me a million bucks fastest. Okay, what else? We got to get you the, hang on, there you go. What you say, though, that obviously the need of, of a solo agent, or if you're trying to create a big team with just a lot of people, definitely is solving the need of leads. But if you're, if you're hiring talent, the biggest need over and over and over again is database. Always. 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 By the way. And they have no idea how to touch it in a meaningful way. That, that's the path to make the million. Right. And they have no systems in place and no people in place to make it happen. And then you ask them the simple question. Well, if someone could do it for you and, they, and you would pay them X percent, would you do it? And they say yes. And then they walk out of the room and never do it. That a hundred percent classic, and that's the path to the million dollars. That, that's why the companies that you see growing the fastest in real estate right now, from a team perspective anyway, are the ones that are solving the most central challenges. And there's only a handful of them, but the number one for everybody is to get the database because of the math that we just did. I mean, think about that 82 percent of all buyers and sellers surveyed said they would use the same real estate agent again. But you, you know that less than 40% do. The delta is just because or the database isn't being touched the right way. That's the single central challenge for our entire industry. The, by, by the way, that's why Zillow can continue to sell the same people year in and year out to the same realtors who keep buying them. <laughs> it's so good. What else? I mean, think about that for a second. You know how many, I mean, like it's a publicly traded company, so you know that they're selling almost 180 million leads a year, right? Like you know that, it's in their file, you've seen it. But there's only like 380 million people in the whole U.S. That company was born in 06. So how is the math work? Unless they have like a people printing machine that I just don't know of. It's just, the math isn't there. They're selling your people to you. They sell Mike's people to Sarah, and Sarah's people to Tom, and Kristen's people to Ben. It's the same people. And the only reason they're able to be sold is because of this. 
Well, because to use your analogy, when they need gas, they don't know your their gas station. So my question to you is, what do you think is going to happen to Zillow and other people like them with this FCC ruling starts to take effect this summer? Gosh, I, you know, I really don't know. Um, Come on, you know everything. I, yeah, I, well, I, knowing it and well, saying Well, it's either going to be now. this or this. So what are those two things, Jason? Well, I think they have a challenge, right? And so does everyone know what the new FCC rules are? So Chris, do you want to educate? Do you want to watch our reels? <laughs> okay, you did a reel on it. Well, tell them what the new rule is. Express written consent must be given to sell leads. So instead of your information going to the next party down the line, you now will have to expressly check mark that that information can pass on. So the price of leads is gonna go through the roof along with the quality, but the price will go through the roof most likely. I think that's exactly right. Uh, here's the deal, whether it's because of that or there are dramatic changes to the way that cooperative compensation works. And I, I have no idea whether there will be or there won't be. Who knows? Here's what I do know. I do know that the people that take the listings are always going to be in good position. It's, it's leads listings leverage. It's not leads buyers leverage. It's, there's a reason for it. The minute that you have a listing that's priced well, that everybody wants, every realtor in town works for you. Does everyone follow me on that? Great, so then we all know we want leads that turn into listings. Do we agree? Great, database. That's the key. That's why you're about to see what I believe is gonna be one of the greatest shifts that we've seen in the last 50 years. Because the world, the real estate world anyway, has gotten, I don't wanna say lazy, but they've gotten complacent buying set it and forget it leads from third party aggregators and CRMs. They have set it and forget it ad spends that run every month. Does anyone, out, does anyone know what I'm talking about here? So you pay like a, like a, like a boom town or a commission thing. They're great companies, but you pay them the same amount of money every month and then new leads come in from the internet. The last thing you people need is more people to ignore. I promise, based on the math that we've all been doing, it isn't a question of new leads. It's a question of deeper relationship. And here's the thing about relationship. Everyone's wrapped around the axle with it. How do, how do I get into better relationships? And what, what are the rules that govern them? And what do I say? And what don't I say? And when do I withhold love? And when do I give it? I'll just make it really easy. If you want to be in deeper relationship with someone, you have to communicate more. If you want to be out of relationship, it's the easiest thing in the world. Stop talking. That's it. That, that's it. I, I, I was talking to the ALC earlier. This dude called me and was like, hey, I'm going through this terrible divorce. I'm, I'm, I'm agonizing. I was like, dude, no problem. Just simply ignore that person for six months. It'll be over. Never talk to him again. You'll be divorced. And the person was like, you're, you're serious? And I was like, well, no. <laughs> that would be stupid, and it would work. Because here's the deal. When you stop talking to somebody, you've ended the relationship. Do you agree with that idea? Great. Then how many people in your current databases have you ended the relationship with except never bothered to tell them you did. <laughs> and that's the indictment. People do business with people they like. You can't possibly hope to be liked if you're not communicating. By the way, this is the same reason that people get out of relationships with businesses. They stop telling those businesses what it will take to be in business with them. They just expect them to know. Well, I didn't want to have to tell you. Well, I don't understand why. I'm right here. Communication is the key to all of it. Okay, what else? Nothing is off limits. You can always end early if you want, but I'll answer anything you want. Yes. Hang on, the mic is coming your way. Other than the playbook on my vision board, ah, which is yes, not going to open. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> no one else thought that was funny. I did. Oh, okay. <laughs> You know, I've, I've heard the story, you tell the story of how you got into real estate, and I'm like fascinated in a great way of how that person became you. Ah. And your worse, your, your use of the American language, the English language is awesome. Yeah, trial and error, it turns out. But I can, there's a model for it. So do you, want, do you want the model? I'd love to hear it. Okay, so um, everyone always says, um, and it's, it, it's gonna sound 
um, there's no way to say this without sounding bad, so I'm just going to say it. But oftentimes when I speak, someone will, people will say, you're really good at that, or I can't believe you do that with no notes, or, you know, like, that, that was incredible, whatever it's going to be. And um, they, they think that it's some sort of talent. Uh, it isn't uh, at all. As a matter of fact, when I started, I was deathly afraid of speaking in groups. And my whole life, I had been told to be quiet by every single educator I ever had. Um, and so how, how did it happen? And when, in my mid-20s, Gary gave me a one-page model for speaking. Now, I'll tell you what it is, but here's the problem. I'm going to destroy some of you because the minute I tell you, you're going to think about all the times you've heard Gary speak, and you're going to be like, oh, my gosh, that was a model. Yeah, probably was. But that doesn't mean that he's any less amazing. But there is a model, and it's called the Lego piece model. And here, here's how it goes. Here's, how, here's what, how he taught me to do it. He said that every great speaker, and by the way, he said that every real estate agent should be able to stand up and give a 30-minute class. Every one of them should be able to do it. And when I said, well, why? And he said, because when you teach people, they move closer to you emotionally. I said, okay, fair enough. How do you do it? He said, it's Lego pieces. Here's how you do it. You got to pick three to five topics that you are 100% and completely comfortable and confident about today. You don't have to learn something new. As we sit here today, you're totally comfortable and confident. Then you have to write, and you can do it as an outline, three to five minutes on that topic. That's all it has to be, three to five minutes on that topic. And because you're confident and an expert, it should be a great three minutes. Next step, you got to practice those three to five Lego pieces every day for 90 days. There's two ways to practice it. Number one is to write it every day. That's going to kill most of us. Number two is to just recite it or, or give it every day. I decided to go with that route. The way that I did it, I set up on my real estate team a call at 3 o'clock every day that was optional. And so they would call in at 3, and I would talk for 10 minutes. And all I was doing was practicing my Lego pieces. That was it. Once you have your 3 to 5 down, like absolutely cold, you do the next 3 to 5. And all you hear me doing and all you see him doing all the time is reciting Lego pieces, and the only thing we're changing is the words in between. I have about 70 Lego pieces now. He's got like 200 plus. And every month or every quarter, I wake up and I write a new one, and I start practicing it like crazy. So this is the secret to public speaking. If you want to be able to do it without notes, then you have to memorize it. The only way to memorize it is to have the Lego pieces, and how it sounds natural is just simply the words in between. Awesome. That's how you do it. Now everyone's going to be a speaker, and I'm out. Great. <laughs> <laughs> well, how many years did it take me? Um, it, it, interestingly enough, it took me 90 days to get the first three to five, because the key is to pick something that you're already wildly confident about. Robert Ringer, there's a great quote by Robert Ringer. Um, and what he says is, if belief cannot be willed, how does one acquire it? And it's a really important question because you don't believe that you can do it. So if belief cannot be willed, how does one acquire it? And he goes on to say that he acquires it the same way that he or she gets an understanding of the world, through the attainment of knowledge and wisdom. Those, those two things. Knowledge is specific education on something. Like you read a book, you get knowledge. You listen to the MRA podcast that I'm on. Does anyone listen to that, just out of curiosity? OK, cool. If you don't, listen to it. Um, you, you, you get knowledge. Wisdom, I believe, and so does he, that everyone is born with all the wisdom you'll need in, inside. You call it intuition. Ladies, statistically, and studies show that you're more in touch with it than guys are. You just know stuff about stuff. We don't know how it happens. Like, it's unbelievable. It's, but it's real. Like, it's, it turns out it's real. Like, this is an actual thing. So you have knowledge and wisdom. The more knowledge and wisdom you have on a topic, the more confidence you have in your beliefs. The more confidence you have in your beliefs, the more ardently you will support them. That's why I say pick something you already know about. You will already ardently know your position and be able to support it. That's why when you ever argue with someone about something you're passionate about, 
Okay, you have no problem doing that, right? Perfect. Then you have wild confidence in that thing. That's what you should pick for your three to five. Most of you do this on listing appointments all day long. You're incredible at it. Great. That's it. I got a oh, go ahead. Uh, Robert Ringer. He, he, he wrote a great book in the uh, 80s. I have a question from chat. Yeah. Okay, so uh, with, social me uh, uh, with social media, where are you finding the trends moving to when it comes to agents and what they're putting out there? I'm trying to figure out where to place myself in communication. Every realtor is doing walkthroughs or the process. What's something different that can grab people's attention? And I want to speak from my heart rather than the same thing over and over again. Yeah, I think the social media models fall into a couple of really distinct ones. There's not that many models. The first one is documenting the journey. And by the way, I should, I should, I'm not on any social media. I'm not even on the face pages. So like, I, you can't find face me on that. Pages. I took that out of my life. Five years ago, I've never been happy. I think it's the bane of our existence. So you do you on the Insta Twitter. Um, Love it. Specific, are they talking about which, the gram, as the kids call it, or YouTube? Which one slaps for them? Okay. Uh, so it, She said any. Which any, okay. Well, that's the challenge. I, I would, okay, I'm gonna talk to the cat. I would think about talk it differently. I wouldn't be thinking about any. The key is to think about one and dominate that one. So rule number one for social media, pick one and go with it. You'll naturally get pulled into more, but you have to own space in one. And the one that you pick will have different algorithmic tendencies, which will change the kind of content that you're making. So it isn't what should I be showing, it's what medium do you like to show it. That will inform you on what you should show. Here's and, what I mean. And when you have success on one, you can literally take the stuff and just shorten it, put that, it on another. That's why you get pulled to another. Yep. So it depends, right? Like if you took Ken Pozak's model on YouTube, which by the way, if you don't listen to the MREA podcast, I think that's insane. And tune in this Monday to hear Ken Pozak as he lays out every step in his YouTube model. It's incredible. It's so good. Um, his, his model is simple. The idea is you will feel like a local of Orlando before you ever set foot in Orlando. So if I was gonna run a model and I lived in a city where people are moving to, like you can't run this in Ohio, but if I was gonna run this and I lived here, I would run his model here. And I would go to his channel and I would list every video that he's made. Then I would look at his count on which videos got the highest viewers, and that's the order that I would make them in. There'd be no creativity at all. And the reason why is because he said seven and a half million views. He makes six million dollars a year. For me, that would be a good profit. And by profit, I mean who am I going to listen to on the gospel of YouTube? Ken. And I would do exactly what he does. So here's what he does. He makes videos about stuff. Here are the five best restaurants. Here are the five worst restaurants. Here are the six reasons not to move to Orlando. Here are the reasons to move to Orlando. Here are the seven things you don't want to do on a bus. Like it's it's just stuff. And what he does is he runs a very simple model for the videos. Number one, it's just him. Number two, he's simply in front of a camera and he says you should use your iPhone. It's got a great camera in it. Number three, start with what you're going to tell them and tell them what you're gonna tell them. Then start telling them. Then remind them what you're gonna tell them. Then tell them some more. Then tell them what you told them. Then end with your email address. By the way, if you think that social media is going to destroy our entire world, you now know why. <laughs> because 7 million people have signed up to watch that. It's insane to me, but that's what they do. And here's how he gets leads from it. Hey, if you're interested in moving to Orlando, email me. I'd love to hear from you. My name is Ken. My email address is Ken at Ken. That's it. Pozek, P-O-Z-E-K. There's no like amazing lead funnel. There's no websites. There's no models. It's just that. So that's model number one. Model number two, invite people to go on the journey with you to real estate. And all that means is you're literally bringing them along on your life. And we've seen, we, we highlighted a woman. She's been in real estate for 90 days. She has 100,000 followers on the tickety tock. And when I said to her, how'd you do it? She said, it's really easy. Every, by the way, it's in the book, but every day, she posts two videos. They're never more than two minutes. 
and she simply asks her a question about real estate. That's it. That blows me away. And I said, well, how did that ever go viral? Here's how it went viral. She did one video on Halloween. She was wearing a pink cowgirl outfit. Pink hat, pink things. It was all pink. <laughs> that went viral. I, no one knows the equation for viral. No one. Even if they tell you they do, they don't. That thing went viral. She now has 100,000 followers that sign up to see what she's doing. So those are the two models that I would run. Mine is, since you do a lot of public speaking and you probably get always the same questions, what is your middle name? Yeah, it's a new one for me. David. Nice. Thanks. That's why we connect. It's the universe. <laughs> All right, who else? Anybody else? Going once, twice. Can I take the last five of the last 10 minutes then and, and ask you guys a question? What's your wealth plan for the next 30 years? You don't have to tell me, but just do you know? If you don't, we got a problem. And by the way, I just asked this question in a room. I was interviewing for Megacamp, and Richard Stone, he's 76 years old, by the way. He is got his 30-year wealth plan. And when I was like, dude, I, like, I don't want to be the one to tell you this, but like, <laughs> like you know. And, he, and it was so funny because he looked at me and goes, I had a really hard time deciding whether to do a 50-year plan or a 30-year plan. I decided to land on 30 because I don't want to overwhelm anyone else. Blew me away. Here's a guy who wakes up thinking he's going to live forever. I love the way he thinks about life. So no one's too old to have a 30-year plan, and no one's too young to start. So write down the number you're going to have in 30 years. The reason I use 30 years is because of the math of it. And this group, everybody is going to fall into two categories. Those of you that wrote less than $50 million and those of you that wrote more than $50 million. If you wrote less than $50 million, I just want to remind you of the math, and it works in this market, that if you bought two to three homes per year every year for the next 30 years, you'd be worth $50 million. So when I say 50 million, everyone's like, oh my gosh, it, it's buying two to three homes a year. And here's the saddest thing in the entire industry. Less than 8% of real estate agents own at least one piece of investment real estate. Less than 8% of real estate agents own at least one piece of investment real estate. That is such an epidemic. That is so sad. Because think about how many we sell. I don't know a single older agent, and by older, I mean they're not in YP, That would because it goes up to 40 now, I'm out. Um, right. I don't know a single agent that would credibly look you in the eye and say, you know what the best thing I ever did for my career was? Not buying houses. But you know what they all say? If I could go back to 98 when I started, or 87, or 84, 78. 78, and I would have bought everything. And do you know what that would have been worth today? I just want to tell you, you have a, you kind of have a little bit of a disease in your brains right now because you're, you overestimate the short term and underestimate the long term. Or you think, well, yeah, but that was back then. That was when houses were, were eight, 80 grand. And now, you know, they're, they're 700. So they won't ever be worth 3 million all one day. Yes, they will. They absolutely will. You know why? Because bankers will always find a way to get people into a monthly payment that they can afford, no matter how much the house is. You know how I know? Because cars. I know You know because cars. I mean, there's a, a, a Jeep Cherokee thing out there. that The base on it's $110,000. It's a wagon ear. It's a car. I mean, like, when you're sp uh, spending 100 grand on a new car now, you're not like an outlier. That's like if you want to buy a new car. It's insanity. But you know what? You can drive it for 750 bucks a month. They figured it out. We just, well, you pay it off in 13 years. It'd be great. <laughs> Bankers will find a way. So the house today that you can go buy for 400 is going to be worth millions in 30 years. 
And some of you are like, no, I don't believe it. Well, how many records have to be broken for you to believe it? I don't understand. Stock market is at an all-time high. It's never been higher. You, don't, you think it's going to keep going up or go down? Over time, mathematical certainty. Since the Great Depression, it's went up nine points a year <clears throat> average. Real estate, going up, not going down. You know how I know? Because there's more people less and less land. That's it. So anyway, that's my final wish for you all. You're either going to start buying real estate and getting on the right side of money, or you're going to stay on the left side of money, which is helping other people buy it. It's a choice. I'm urging you to do both. Be on the left and the right side of money. There's a river of money that throws through the world, and there's a group of people that know how to stand right in it. And it hits them, and they collect it all. And everyone else is like, oh my gosh, how did they do that? How did they know? Because there's certain rules that never change. Number one, inheritance is awesome. <laughs> it's how the richest people in the world get rich, inheritance. Now, that model might not work for you. It doesn't work for me. I've been trying to get the Kellers to adopt me for five years. They like their son. So I'm out. So how do the richest people in the world make their money if inheritance is out? They own a business. Number three, stock and real estate. That's it. Those are the three ways the richest people make their money. And the math on rich people is incredible. You know, there's not that many of us. I'm putting all of you in the same group. There's only a handful of us. In the, there's 8 billion people. But in the whole world, there's only 22 and a half million rich people. That's it. And here's how I'm defining rich. You have a million dollars in cash to invest right now, excluding the equity in your home and the value of any collectibles or personal items. So you can't count your Beanie Babies. There's only 22 and a half million of us total in the whole world. A third of that group lives in the US. The other two thirds are spread out over the rest of the entire globe which means you have a more of a chance of being rich here than anywhere else, regardless of how broken you think the country might be. Just think about that for a second. Like you, you, Warren Buffett calls it winning the ovarian lottery. <laughs> Either being born in the US or somehow getting here, he says you've already won because of the math I just gave you. So now, think about wealth slightly differently which is those are the ways that people get rich. You all own your business, and you all are in the real estate business. You're in pole position for number two and number three right off the bat. So anybody that stops you in the street and is like, hey, I got another way for you to get rich. You should sell watches. Or you should get involved in this toothpaste company. It's ground floor. None of that's real. You, you should do it through blank. None of the richest people in the world did it through blank. Why would you? You just need to generate leads and buy a couple houses a year and then do it for 30 years without talking to anybody, and you're going to be the richest person you know. And then you have a choice with the money. You either spend it all on a yacht and a helicopter, or you give it to whoever's next. I hope they don't screw it up. That's it. Fair? Thanks for coming, you guys. Yeah. How was it? Thank you guys for being here. A couple things. And uh, I have no fancy questions or anything. I've got two copies. I went with the two hands I saw first. You guys have that. Now use it and share it with other people. All right? Uh, Jason highlighted his podcast, the MREA podcast. If you want to subscribe on Apple or Spotify, the QR codes are up there. If you want to learn a little bit more about Jason and his journey, he'll be kicking off season four of my podcast, the Real, Real Talk podcast with David. So be looking for that. I know many of you guys are subscribed. Um, and the next major event that I want to clue all of you in on one of the things that we've been hearing from you so much, specifically you rainmakers that are leading teams, is how you can become a better attractor, recruiter of talent. And so January 25th at 11 o'clock, we will be hosting a Zoom as a team leader collective. Anyone in our offices who's in a recruiting position um, are going to share some of our best practices for how each of us 
have attracted hundreds, if not thousands, of agents to our company in the effort of making you guys um, better attractors on your team. Jason already gave you the one pager for $100,000 and how you could create that to be an attractor. I would say go make that now, bring it to the January 25th Zoom and we will tear it apart, okay? We'll put on our Gary Keller hat and try and tear it apart. January 25th, the link, all Rainmakers in our office will be invited to that. If you are thinking about starting a team and growing a team, um, we can get you the invite as well. So be looking in the newsletters on Sunday. Lunch will be served in the cafe. Thank you to Team Riz at 210 Home Warranty for an amazing event. Give them a round of applause. So in the cafe, if you have any questions, bathrooms are down the hall to your left. Kristen, you have something yes. to share? So you heard Jason talk about Quantum Leap and how important it is, and it doesn't get taught nearly enough. Um, Joe and I taught it this summer up in Alaska, and we're going to be teaching it here the 23rd and 24th of January. It will be via Zoom, so you can find it in our newsletter uh, on Sunday. But, do, you know, Jason said it. It's like it, it's, it's a complete life plan, and it really takes you through the four different boxes of life that most of us think of happening sequentially instead of happening simultaneously. Um, life productivity, work productivity, business productivity, and wealth. So, you know, Gary says it's the number one class you should take every single year. And so uh, all of you, since you're uh, agents in our market center, get to take the class for free. So if you want to sign up, um, we've got the, the link in the newsletter of our weekly, uh, the Sunday newsletter. So January 23rd, January 24th, January 25th, packing you guys with value. Last thing I'm going to say, one of my other mentors in this company, Brady Sandahl, loves to say, make it simple, easy, and beautiful for your agents. One of the things that I want to stress to you is how simple and easy, maybe beautiful too. Oh. Um, <laughs> Simple and easy. KC Doty can set up the touch plan. Get with him. Tom can create your email market update. Get with him. In all of our offices, you have the person to make it simple and easy. Stop looking for CRMs. Stop trying to find the silver bullet. Get into command. Get with our people. Get it set up. And we'll do more in 24.